Well, let's go over a basic approach to reading abdominal radiographs. And we'll start with this patient here, and we'll be able to look at supine and upright views of the abdomen. And I'll go over my general approach and try to keep it simple without overwhelming you with details. So the first thing we'll take care of is the uh, most common indication that these are uh, obtained for, which is going to be obstruction. That's going to require evaluation of the uh, bowel gas pattern. So first we want to determine small bowel from colon. You can do this a uh, number of ways. You want to obviously look for the expected anatomic location of the colon with the descending colon on the left, the ascending colon on the right, to varying degrees depending on how much air is within it. The transverse colon should be laying transversely across the upper abdomen, and depending on how redundant the sigmoid colon is, you would expect it to be seen down in the pelvis. The small bowel will be more central to this. Uh, some of the other things you can use to differentiate would be, uh, one, the presence of the modeled appearance of feces within the colon. Uh, you can also look for Hofstra in the colon versus valveal conventes in the small bowel, which should be more circumferential around the entire small bowel. And once you do that, you then have to determine both the size and gas distribution of the air within the bowel. I try and keep it simple and say if I am looking at, to determine if I'm looking at what I think is an obstructive process or a non-obstructive process, and anything I can't say that is either one of those is more indeterminate, and we'll discuss that later. Some general numbers I use, I try and keep it above three centimeters in size for a small bowel would be abnormal. For colon, it sort of depends on where you are. You can have up to eight to nine centimeters for the cecum, but only uh, six centimeters in the transverse colon before it starts getting abnormal. So that sort of bowel dilatation make you think of obstruction, especially if it's localized to just the small bowel. Uh, the other things you'd be looking for is air fluid levels. Air fluid levels within the small bowel, especially when they're at a differential level, almost a, what could sometimes be called stepladder appearance, is pretty highly specific for obstruction. If you don't have this bowel dilatation or these air fluid levels and you have air throughout the colon and the small bowel, to an equal extent, you're looking at what is just a non-obstructive bowel gas pattern. If uh, you have this bowel dilatation, and especially if it's uh, predominantly either in the small bowel or potentially just in the colon, you'd be looking at potentially either small bowel or colonic obstruction. There are numerous times where you'll be presented with some mildly scattered loops of small bowel that are dilated with or without air fluid levels and air still throughout the colon to about an equal extent. This is when I generally say that the bowel gas pattern is nonspecific. I try and reserve using that terminology only if I can't classify it as either non-obstructed or obstructed, depending, what you could, depending on the presence of air fluid levels and how many dilated loops of bowel you see. You could be looking in those situations at just an early obstruction, a partial small bowel obstruction, potentially ileus, which will generally have the same amount of air in the colon and small bowel. And then if you don't have any dilatation in air fluid levels in the small bowel, it becomes even you know, less specific and maybe just looking at an enteritis. After the small bowel, there are still plenty of soft tissues that we need to evaluate. <clears throat> One of the other common things is to look for the renal shadows. On this exam, you can sort of make out where the left renal shadow should be living over here. The right is going to be harder to see. One of the reasons we're looking for that is because you want to see calcifications. And sometimes it's hard to tell, say, this little density here, if you're looking at a calcification, which could be a renal stone or potentially bowel contents. You also will want to look along what would be the expected course of the ureters, which will come medially along the spine, inferiorly into the pelvis. Again, looking for potential renal or ureteral calculi. If you have this case where there are these densities that could be in the bowel or could be in the kidney, the upright views sometimes may be useful, with the bowel moving dependently with gravity and maybe the potential calculus you're looking at is no longer visible over the renal shadow. After that, you can look at other fat planes you should be expect to see, for instance here, the psoas muscles on either side. If you lose that, that could be indicative of pathology such as retroperitoneal hemorrhage. And then of course, uh, we wouldn't want to forget the osseous structures. In this patient, we have these sclerotic foci, which likely will be bone islands, 
but you, you, you'll have a view of the lumbar spine, the sacral iliac joints, arcuate lines, pubic symphysis, obturator rings, the proximal femurs. On this upright view from the same patient, along the other soft tissue, shadows that we're able to see is the liver shadow in the right upper quadrant and the splenic shadow partly in the left upper quadrant. You can potentially call splenomegaly and hepatomegaly off of abdominal radiographs. And of course, the other entity that will always be paramount to evaluate for is going to be free air, pneumoperitoneum, easily picked up with upright films where you will expect to see the free air collecting under the diaphragm. Uh, on this view, we obviously only have the left hemidiaphragm fully incorporated, but not the right. Um, but you would expect the air to be collecting in these locations here. Usually easier seen over the liver shadow where you don't have to differentiate the free air from potentially the stomach bubble. Okay, so this is a different patient uh, which will be useful to better look at the stomach bubble. And again, here's colon with the Hofstra markings you'd expect to see. Here is stool with in the distal rectosigmoid colon. Here is the right renal shadow to a little better effect than on the prior exam. Again, you can see how the psoas shadows might be more difficult to see all the time. You get a sense that one is here and the other is likely here. Uh, this will also show common finding. You'll see a bunch of surgical clips in the right upper quadrant, which are most commonly due to a cholecystectomy. Okay, again, moving to a different patient. This one has a percutaneous gastrojejunostomy, which would be nice to show you the anatomy. So there's self-retaining loop here is in the stomach, exiting into the C loop of the duodenum towards the ligament atrites, and then the distal part of the tube is within the proximal jejunum. Uh, and here shows the expected location of your colon from the ascending colon all the way through the rectum, and this is a Foley catheter in the bladder. We'll use this case to highlight the uh, expected location of the ureters. These are bilateral nephroureteral catheters. This self-retaining loop here is in the renal pelvis on the left, and then from there to this loop here in the bladder is the course of the ureter. Same thing on the right. We have the self-retaining loop in the right renal pelvis coursing through the right ureter until it reaches the bladder. This is the location we expect it to look for, renal and ureteral calculi. You can see this renal shadow here quite nicely on the right, and the left do the overlying bowel gas, and uh, gastrostomy is not as well seen. This is the gastrostomy to bubble here. Again, we have the stomach, stool in the colon, air in the colon, some air in non dilated loops of small bowel. And lastly, we'll move on to a separate patient that uh, will be used to highlight uh, the case of small bowel obstruction. And so as I was saying uh, previously, one of the first assessments we'll do is to look at the bowel gas pattern. So here we obviously have air within bowel loops and we're going to try and determine is this colonic or small bowel. So just based on location here and here, the fact that you have these circumferential rings in these bowel loops, this is going to be small bowel. In case there was a doubt, you could see that this loop above it has the typical hostrations that we expect to see with the transverse colon. Here is the descending and sigmoid colon. Here is the expected location of the ascending colon. These loops up here, again, you'd have to help, you'd have to try and determine, are we looking at splenic flexure or dilated small bowel? And again, we can see the circumferential densities of the valvulae conaventes. This is a dilated loop of small bowel. So we have air there, and then these different straight lines are the air fluid levels at multiple different levels within the small bowel, and this is highly specific for small bowel obstruction. You can see that the patient has had recent surgery, and uh, this certainly could be due to adhesions, the uh, most common cause in this day and age. Uh, as I stated before, when we're doing the assessment, you also want to look at the relative amount of air within the small bowel versus colon. You can see there's much more air in the small bowel, which is dilated, versus a lot less air in the colon, which appears non-dilated. These all favor the small bowel obstruction. So in summary, like any radiographs we look at, there are multiple different areas we need to assess. The small bowel pattern of air, the colonic pattern of air, the soft tissue shadows from the renal shadows and the psoas shadows to include the hepatic and splenic shadows and of course the osseous structures. I uh, return to the 
initial radiograph here, which is showing us essentially non-obstructed bowel gas pattern. And we'll return to the last radiograph here, showing us the classic appearance of a small bowel obstruction. I'll conclude with a few words on differentiating these two again as this is the most often cause of confusion uh, when initially assessing abdominal radiographs. Overall, you're trying to determine which bowel you're looking at, be it small bowel or large bowel, if dilatation of either of those is present, if that dilatation involves only the small bowel or only the large bowel, if there are air fluid levels present, and also the relative amount of air within the small bowel versus the colon. All these will help decide if you want to label something as an obstructive bowel gas pattern, a non-obstructed bowel gas pattern, and occasionally a uh, bowel gas pattern won't fit into either of those two and give you a more non-specific picture as we discussed.